my name's Andrew Kent. I'm an instructor in the BMT division. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Schwartz today. Um, he grew up in Long Island, uh, got uh, some undergraduate and graduate training in New York um, before doing his uh, residency at University of Miami, um, as well as his fellowship in uh, hematology and oncology at the uh, University of California in San Diego. Um, that was until 2020. Um, he moved here as an assistant professor in hematology, focusing on acute lymphoid malignancies, um, of which he's become a super uh, local expert um, and our go-to guy for all uh, acute lymphoid malignancies, mm -hmm. especially acute lymphoid leukemias, um, as well as transplants um, that are part of the crucial part of the therapy of those uh, diseases. Um, so um, with no further ado, uh, Dr. Mark Schwartz, take it away. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so um, yeah, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, so today I'll be talking about the management of adults uh, with uh, relapsed or refractory uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia uh, in the era of immunotherapy. And uh, more specifically, um, we'll focus on the role of uh, CAR T cell therapy. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, so we'll start with case number one. So this is a 64-year-old woman with Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL um, who receives desatinib plus prednisone induction, uh, followed by a haploidentical stem cell transplant in the first remission, uh, and then it started on the satin and maintenance uh, around 60 days after her transplant. Uh, at around eight months post-transplant, uh, she begins to experience severe headaches. Uh, an MRI of her brain is normal. Um, however, a lumbar puncture shows uh, diffuse infiltration of the CSF uh, with uh, leukemic B cells. Uh, her bone marrow biopsy shows no evidence of morphologic disease, uh, but does show evidence of minimal residual disease uh, by uh, BCR-ABLE uh, quantitative uh, PCR testing. Uh, so with a patient like this um, uh, with uh, relapsed uh, ALL after an allogeneic stem cell transplant, uh, I think it's just helpful to you know, run through all the potential uh, treatment options. Um, so um, if the patient is able to uh, achieve a subsequent remission, um, then uh, the patient would be eligible for a second uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant, um, which does have the potential to lead to a, uh, a long-term durable remission uh, in a, a fraction of patients with relapsed acute leukemias. Um, however, you know, this therapy is uh, largely limited by um, uh, uh, excessive toxicity um, and, and high rates of uh, transplant-related mortality. Um, number two would be a donor lymphocyte infusion, or a DLI, um, where we're attempting to uh, augment the graft-versus-leukemia effect uh, from the transplant by giving uh, unmanipulated immune effector cells from the donor. Um, this therapy is also uh, limited by um, its, its main toxicity, uh, which is graft versus host disease. Um, and in general, um, you know, very few patients with uh, relapsed acute leukemias uh, will go on to achieve a, a durable remission with a DLI alone. Uh, Blinatumumab is a, uh, a CD19-directed bispecific uh, T-cell-engaging antibody. Uh, inotuzumab is a CD22-directed uh, antibody drug conjugate. Um, these therapies uh, can be you know, very effective um, uh, for uh, relapse ALL in terms of uh, getting a patient back into a subsequent remission. Um, however, on their own, uh, these are not uh, thought to be uh, therapies that can lead to a, a long-term durable remission. Um, the same thing applies with other uh, uh, types of systemic therapy, uh, whether they be uh, targeted therapy or traditional chemotherapy. 
so CD19 uh, CAR T cell therapy, um, which uh, we'll spend the, the rest of the talk focusing on, um, you know, really has emerged as uh, I think the, the standard of care for uh, the majority of adults with relapsed ALL uh, after an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, and because, and, and we'll, we'll talk more about, you know, this therapy uh, does have the potential to uh, lead to long-term durable remissions um, and does have a, a toxicity profile um, that is favorable um, compared to some other uh, more toxic therapies, such as a second uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant. So, um, you know, what, what are typical outcomes with uh, CAR T cell therapy uh, in relapse refractory ALL? Um, so looking across uh, a number of uh, different studies uh, in adults and, and pediatric patients with ALL, um, the overall response rate with CAR T cell therapy um, is somewhere around 70 to 90%. Um, however, the rate of failure um, after CAR T cell therapy is approximately 50%. Um, and this includes both failure to achieve remission um, or more commonly um, the achievement of remission uh, followed by a subsequent relapse. Uh, most relapses after CAR T cell therapy occur within the first year. Um, this figure here um, is from a five-year follow-up of the uh, landmark uh, Ileana study, um, which led to the approval of uh, Tisagen Leclucel in uh, pediatric and young adult patients. Um, and what um, is depicted on this curve here uh, is that amongst responders to uh, CAR T cell therapy, um, an event-free survival of approximately 50% uh, was largely sustained um, after two years of follow-up, um, suggesting that um, if patients achieve a, a remission after CAR T um, and they maintain that remission for two years, um, generally they are expected to um, go on to have uh, long-term uh, durable remissions. So the mechanisms underlying relapse after CAR T, um, you know, broadly speaking, there are two major mechanisms. Uh, number one is loss of persistence of the CARs. Um, and this uh, usually leads to um, antigen positive or, or CD19 positive uh, a leukemia relapse. Um, and number two is antigen escape. Um, so this is where the leukemia cells lose their expression of the CD19 antigen um, and the leukemia relapses as uh, CD19 negative disease. Uh, there are a number of risk factors for relapse uh, after CAR T. Um, I listed some of them here. This is not an exhaustive list, um, but uh, just uh, contains a, 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 you know, a few risk factors that I think are worth mentioning. Um, so first, um, uh, prior uh, lines of therapy. Um, so the more uh, prior lines of therapy a patient has received, um, the, the worse um, the uh, expected outcome, uh, which is not surprising. Um, this is likely uh, due to these patients just having intrinsically more resistant disease um, and also uh, possibly just uh, poorer uh, T cell fitness uh, due to successive lines of uh, cytotoxic therapy. Um, uh, prior receipt of blenitumumab as a risk factor for relapse after CAR T um, is a, a little bit more controversial. Um, there are some studies showing that uh, prior blena uh, has no impact on outcomes after, uh, after CAR-T, uh, whereas other studies um, have shown that uh, prior blena uh, does have a detrimental effect on outcomes uh, post-CAR-T. Um, and this is likely due to um, downregulation of CD19 uh, in, in response to blena, uh, which uh, leaves patients more susceptible to uh, antigen escape uh, after CAR-T. Um, disease burden uh, at the time of infusion uh, is a risk factor for relapse after CAR. Uh, so greater than uh, greater than or equal to five percent uh, marrow blasts at the time of infusion. 
um, is a, um, a negative prognostic factor for relapse. Um, at the same time, a uh, low number or low percentage of CD19 antigen expressing B cells in the bone marrow, um, uh, whether they be uh, uh, leukemic B cells or normal B cells, um, is also a risk factor for relapse post CAR T. Um, and this is due to um, just the um, uh, diminished uh, CAR expansion and persistence um, when the CARs don't have um, an, adequate, um, uh, an adequate target to, to hit. Um, and then factors related to the CAR itself. Um, so 41BB uh, based CARs, uh, such as uh, Tisagen Leclu cell, um, are thought to have better persistence than uh, CD28 based CARs. Um, it's, um, and this is, this is thought to potentially um, lead to better outcomes with 41BB based CARs. Um, however, this has not yet been studied in uh, any head-to-head uh, -head, uh, uh, prospective or, or retrospective study. Um, there are some practical considerations to, to keep in mind when uh, treating a patient with ALL uh, with uh, CAR T cell therapy. Um, uh, so number one, uh, does the patient need immediate treatment uh, at the time of their relapse? Uh, number two, uh, when will the patient undergo leukophoresis? Um, this is, um, you know, in practice, largely determined by uh, availability of apheresis and manufacturing, um, but does also depend uh, somewhat on uh, whether a patient needs immediate treatment at the time of their relapse um, and what uh, type of treatment they receive. Um, and then number three, uh, what bridging therapy uh, will be used between leukophoresis and infusion of CAR T cells? Um, so returning to the case, so just um, uh, just to recap, this is a 64-year-old woman with pH positive ALL um, who has a, a CNS relapse eight months after her stem cell transplant. So given that the patient was uh, symptomatic with overt CNS disease, um, we decided that the patient would benefit from immediate treatment. Uh, so she was urgently admitted to start high-dose systemic methotrexate, uh, and twice-weekly intrathecal chemotherapy, uh, and was scheduled to undergo leukophoresis um, in two weeks from receipt of her systemic chemotherapy. Um, her uh, headaches improved with initiation of chemotherapy, um, and she underwent successful leukophoresis. Her CSF blasts were downtrending at the time of leukophoresis, uh, but did still remain present. Um, so this uh, now gets to the question of bridging therapy. Um, so with bridging therapy, um, you know, our goal is to really um, debulk the disease as much as possible um, before, um, before giving the CAR T cells. Um, and this is particularly important uh, for patients who have CNS disease. Uh, we really want to get them into a CNS remission uh, before giving the CARs. Uh, to uh, minimize the risk of uh, neurologic toxicity, um, which can be um, severe and, and even fatal um, in patients who have CNS, uh, who have active CNS disease. So the patient receives an additional cycle of high-dose methotrexate uh, as bridging um, and continues twice-weekly intrathecal chemotherapy. Uh, she gets to the point where her CSF becomes uh, negative for leukemic cells and um, she undergoes uh, infusion of the CAR T cells after uh, uh, lymphodepleting chemotherapy. Um, despite you know, getting the patient into a CNS remission, um, her course was still complicated by grade three neurotoxicity, um, which did uh, completely resolve uh, with uh, treatment with steroids and anakinra. Unfortunately, um, this patient remains in an ongoing remission um, at over uh, one year post CAR T. Um, so moving on now to case number two. Um, so this is a 63-year-old man with uh, Philadelphia chromosome negative B-cell ALL who was treated with multi-agent chemotherapy induction uh, followed by blenituumab uh, and then a uh, haplocord stem cell transplant. Um, as is per our uh, usual practice here, 
um, we began routine monitoring of uh, NGS-based uh, MRD uh, from the patient's peripheral blood uh, every three months uh, post-transplant. And at around nine months post-transplant, um, three of three uh, leukemia-specific uh, clonal sequences, um, which had previously been undetectable, um, now had become detectable in the blood uh, at a level of uh, one times 10 to the negative four, um, raising concern for uh, recurrence of disease. So his follow-up bone marrow biopsy did confirm uh, disease recurrence uh, with 1.5% uh, B lymphoblasts. Uh, his CBC at this time was normal um, and the patient was asymptomatic. So for uh, patients with uh, uh, MRD-only relapses or asymptomatic um, and just picked up on surveillance testing, uh, we usually want to avoid uh, immediately giving those patients chemotherapy um, and just uh, instead you know, proceed directly to uh, leukapheresis. Um, so that's what we did with this patient. Uh, he underwent immediate collection of CAR T cells uh, followed by bridging with low-intensity chemotherapy, uh, and his CAR T-cells were infused uh, approximately three weeks later. Um, he tolerated treatment well uh, without um, uh, development of CRS or ICANS. So his bone marrow biopsy at day 30 post-CAR T um, showed a morphologic remission uh, that was MRD negative by flow cytometry, um, his NGS MRD, however, showed uh, the same uh, three of three uh, leukemia-specific clonal sequences uh, remained positive uh, at a level of less than one times 10 to the negative six, or um, uh, less than the limit of detection of the assay. Um, and sorting of his uh, peripheral blood lymphocytes by flow cytometry um, showed that uh, CD19 positive B cells uh, were present at 1.3% uh, um, or uh, 22 per microliter. Uh, so this uh, leads into a, a discussion of, you know, how do we monitor uh, patients with ALL post-CAR T um, in order to uh, determine uh, which patients are um, at high risk for relapse? And so one thing we look at is uh, recovery of B cells post-CAR T. Um, so B cell recovery um, is a, uh, a surrogate for uh, persistence of the CAR T cells. Um, so if the, you know, if the CAR T cells are active, um, we expect um, B cells to be suppressed, whether they're leukemic B cells or normal B cells. So this figure is from a uh, retrospective analysis of uh, pediatric patients uh, on the early uh, tissue gen likely cell studies. And they looked at outcomes um, uh, according to um, duration of B cell aplasia uh, within the first year post-CAR. Um, so this um, orange curve here um, represents uh, patients who lost B cell aplasia um, within the first three months post-CAR. Um, and then each successive curve uh, above represents patients who lost B cell aplasia between three and six months, uh, between six and nine months, between nine and 12 months. And then this black curve is patients who did not lose B cell aplasia at all uh, within the first year post-CAR. So what overall what this is showing is that uh, within the first year post CAR, um, generally the the early the loss of B cell aplasia and the earlier the loss of functional persistence of the CARs, um, the, uh, the the higher the likelihood of relapse. And so you know furthermore what this what this gets at is that. Um, there is likely uh, a, a critical uh, duration of CAR persistence um, that is necessary um, in order for patients to achieve a long-term durable remission. Um, for most patients, that's probably going to be uh, somewhere between 6 and 12 months. There's probably some uh, variability from patient to patient. 
Um, however, um, loss of B-cell aplasia uh, within the first six months post-CAR um, is considered a, uh, a negative prognostic indicator um, uh, uh, conferring a uh, higher risk for, for relapse. Um, NGS MRD post-CAR um, is another um, uh, main prognostic indicator uh, that we use to predict risk of relapse. Um, so these figures are from the same uh, retrospective analysis of uh, patients on the early Kim Raya studies, um, and they looked at outcomes according to um, NGS MRD status at day 28 and, and month three uh, post-CAR. Um, so at day 28 post-CAR, um, they looked at outcomes according to uh, whether patients uh, were completely NGS MRD negative um, or whether they had um, any evidence of NGS MRD, um, even including patients who had um, NGS MRD at less than one times 10 to the negative six. Um, and they found a pretty uh, striking difference um, in outcomes um, where patients who were completely NGS MRD negative um, uh, had much better outcomes compared to those who had um, any evidence of NGS MRD. And then at month three post-CAR, um, the differences were, were even more striking um, with uh, patients who had any evidence of NGS MRD um, at three months um, really had uh, quite dismal outcomes um, compared to patients who were completely NGS MRD negative. So going back to the case, um, so we decided to uh, repeat this patient's bone marrow at day 60 post-CAR, uh, which remained MRD negative by flow. Um, however, his uh, NGS MRD uh, was now detectable at a level of one times 10 to the negative four. Um, and his uh, B cells in the peripheral blood were, were clearly starting to recover. Um, so this is a patient, this is a case now where um, you know, this patient is clearly um, at, at very high risk for developing uh, uh, morphologic relapse um, without any, um, any type of intervention. Um, so what are our, our options for intervention? Um, so we can take the patient to an allogeneic stem cell transplant, um, which would be um, the patient's second transplant. Um, we can reinfuse CAR T cells um, or we can give um, some other type of systemic therapy. So this, um, you know, gets to the question of, you know, how do we optimally manage uh, patients post-CAR um, who are at um, high risk for relapse? Um, and the therapy that's been best studied um, in, this, in this scenario is a consolidative uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, so I'll, I'll skip over uh, some of the details of these um, individual studies, um, but we'll say that um, there is now um, an abundant amount of evidence from retrospective studies um, suggesting that uh, patients who receive a consolidative allotransplant after CAR um, do have a lower risk of relapse um, and better leukemia-free survival compared to patients who um, are not consolidated with allotransplant. Um, so what does that, what does this mean for practice? Um, there is, you know, a considerable practice variation between centers um, in terms of uh, the role of uh, allo consolidative allotransplant after CAR. Um, I think, you know, patients who are transplant naive, who, is, who have not had a previous transplant and who are at high risk for relapse um, really, you know, should be considered um, as candidates for consolidative allogeneic stem cell transplant, um, whereas patients who have had a previous uh, stem cell transplant prior to CAR T cell therapy um, were usually not uh, very enthusiastic about consolidating them with a second allo transplant. Um, however, it does you know, become a consideration uh, for certain patients who are at high risk of relapse um, and who do not have um, any other uh, 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 very good options. So what about reinfusion of CAR T cells? So outcomes you know, after reinfusion of CAR T cells and ALL um, have been reported um, in the setting of patients who have uh, over relapse uh, after their initial CAR. 
Um, and, and the outcomes um, you know, in that setting are, are not very good. Uh, most patients do not achieve uh, a remission after reinfusion, um, and any remissions that are achieved are usually um, pretty short-lived. Um, but in the setting of um, uh, uh, using CAR T-cell reinfusion for patients who are at high risk of relapse um, due to early loss of B-cell aplasia or emergence of low-level MRD, um, there is a, a little bit more interest and a little bit more promise um, for uh, reinfusion of, of CARs. Um, so the largest uh, data set uh, to date, um, you know, for, for reinfusing CARs in this setting uh, comes from the Penn Shop Group, uh, where they reported on 63 patients who were reinfused uh, for relapse prevention in the setting of early loss of B-cell aplasia. 52% uh, of patients uh, achieved a, a CR uh, after reinfusion, uh, which was defined by uh, having no evidence of leukemia uh, and restoration of B-cell aplasia. Uh, and uh, when they looked at the 24-month the cumulative incidence of relapse, um, they found that it was lower at 29% for patients who achieved a remission uh, versus 60% um, who uh, six percent in patients who did not achieve a response at all, um, suggesting that potentially uh, there is a benefit for uh, CAR reinfusion um, in the setting of uh, early uh, loss of B-cell aplasia. Um, so going back to the case, um, so you know, reviewing these options. So this is a patient who is in his sixties, um, a little bit frail. Um, and, and overall, not a great candidate for a second uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, other systemic therapies um, could be used to potentially get the patient back into an MRD negative remission, um, but on their own would not likely lead to a durable long term remission. So that left us with a reinfusion of CAR T cells as you know, what we thought was the best option for this patient. Uh, so the patient underwent an immediate second infusion of CAR T cells um, after uh, lymphodepletion with uh, intensified doses of fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. Um, we did this based on a report from the NCI group uh, showing possibly uh, better expansion and better persistence um, after using uh, intensified uh, uh, flu side lymphodepletion. Um, his bone marrow biopsy at day 30 post reinfusion showed that he was now. Uh, NGS MRD negative, um, and his B cells were appropriately suppressed. Uh, his bone marrow biopsy at day 90 uh, post reinfusion uh, showed, uh, you know, excitingly that he was he remained NGS MRD negative. Um, however, uh, his B cells were starting to recover, um, which was a, a little bit of a worrisome sign. So, you know, in a, in an attempt to hopefully uh, prolong this remission. Uh, we started the patient on oral chemotherapy maintenance at the time of his uh, loss of B-cell aplasia. Um, however, he uh, could only tolerate this for only about three months. Um, however, the patient uh, does remain in an ongoing uh, MRD negative remission at over 10 months uh, post reinfusion, uh, which has been you know, really exciting and, and nice to see. Um, so wrapping up with the, the final case here, uh, so this is a 22-year-old man uh, with a relapsed pH-like ALL uh, who achieved their second remission with chemotherapy, uh, followed by a matched sibling donor allogeneic stem cell transplant with uh, myeloablative TBI-based conditioning. Um, as with the previous patient, uh, we monitored uh, NGS MRD from his peripheral blood, uh, which unfortunately became positive at around 12 months uh, post transplant. Uh, his follow up bone marrow was negative for ALL by morphology and flow, uh, but did confirm the rising uh, NGS MRD clone. Uh, so, similar to the previous case, uh, the patient underwent uh, immediate leukapheresis, uh, followed by bridging with low-intensity chemotherapy, um, and then uh, lymphodepletion and infusion of CAR T cells. 
Uh, day 30, uh, his marrow was MRD negative by flow and NGS, uh, and his B cells were appropriately suppressed. At day 60, however, uh, his B cells were beginning to clearly recover. Um, however, his bone marrow remained um, NGS MRD negative. Um, so what are our options here for um, a patient with early loss of B-cell aplasia after CAR um, who's at, at high risk for relapse? Um, so the options are similar to um, uh, the options for the previous patient um, with the addition of um, a uh, potentially a watch weight approach for this patient. Um, although he does have early loss of B-cell aplasia, um, he uh, has no evidence of disease yet um, by, by NGS or, or any other testing methods. So taking all these options into account, um, we, and, and talking, you know, talking through them with the patient, um, we decided to, um, uh, decided to give the patient a reinfusion of CAR T cells um, after intensified leucide lymphodepletion, uh, similar to what we did with the previous patient. Um, at day 30, um, his bone marrow remained NGS MRD negative. Um, his B cells um, had not um, become aplastic, however. And at day 60, um, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, N his NGS MRD uh, began to become uh, positive again, um, and his uh, B cells were clearly recovering in the peripheral blood. So our options now are a little bit more limited. Um, so we, you know, we tried to reinfuse CAR T cells. It, it was not effective. Um, so really now, um, you know, for this patient, probably the, the best and really the only chance of achieving a, a durable long-term remission um, would be uh, a second uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, but you know, before the transplant, before we take him to a second transplant, um, we do want to get him back into an NGS MRD negative remission. Um, so the patient uh, starts uh, on chemotherapy, um, undergoes assessment of his CNS, um, which does actually show um, overt leukemia uh, in his CSF, um, which is uh, CD19 positive. Um, so this gives us rationale to treat the patient with blenitumumab. Um, uh, in, in order to get him back into an NGS negative remission. Uh, so the patient uh, receives one cycle of Blenna um, and becomes NGS MRD negative. Um, and then following that proceeds to a second uh, matched sibling allogeneic stem cell transplant with uh, myeloablative chemotherapy-based conditioning. Um, and is now uh, uh, currently three months out from his second transplant. Uh, so to conclude, um, so CD19 CAR T cell therapy, um, I think, you know, really should be considered the standard of care um, in the majority of, it, of adults with B cell ALL um, that has relapsed after an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, the, the management of adults with relapsed B-cell ALL who will receive CAR-T um, does require some careful thought um, regarding the therapy that's used for initial management of the relapse um, and for bridging. Uh, we need to balance the risk of toxicities from this therapy um, and also the potential for toxicities from the CAR-T cell therapy, uh, which is um, highly correlated with disease burden at the time of infusion. And also we need to take into account uh, the risk of relapse after CAR-T, um, which is uh, correlated both with disease burden um, and also with um, percentage of uh, antigen expressing B cells in the marrow um, at the time of infusion. And then early and frequent monitoring for loss of B cell aplasia and persistent or rising NGS MRD um, allows for identification of patients who are at high risk of relapse and who may benefit from early intervention with allogeneic stem cell transplant, uh, reinfusion of CAR T cells, um, or uh, potentially other, uh, other therapies. Um, so, you know, feature directions. So, 
Um, you know, one uh, area uh, where I think um, uh, CAR T cell therapy is 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 heading in ALL uh, in the immediate future is um, is dual antigen targeting. So uh, not just targeting uh, one antigen, CD19, uh, but targeting both uh, CD19 and CD22. Um, as depicted in this figure here, um, there are a number of different methods uh, that can be used to achieve this dual antigen targeting. Um, and um, uh, no one method has yet been shown to be superior to any others. Um, but I think it'll be, um, you know, very interesting to see how this uh, plays out um, in, in the next few years. Um, and then just wanted to uh, finish with a slide uh, showing our um, active uh, adult ALL uh, CAR T cell trials uh, here at Anschutz. Um, so the first one is uh, a study that we're uh, all pretty, you know, excited about. Um, and this is a study uh, a phase one study um, using our uh, homegrown uh, UCD, uh, CAR, UCD19 CAR T cell product um, in patients, um, uh, not, not in patients with relapse or refractory disease, um, but in the frontline setting for patients who are in their first complete remission, um, but who are considered at high risk for relapse um, due to persistence of minimal residual disease. And then our second study, uh, we have open is um, uh, the UCART 22 study, uh, which is an uh, allogeneic uh, off the shelf uh, uh, anti CD22 CAR um, for patients uh, with uh, relapse or refractory ALL um, who have previously received a CD19 directed therapy, uh, whether that be uh, blinitumumab or uh, CD19 CAR. Um, so with that, um, thank you uh, very much for your attention, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Hey, really a nice talk, Mark. This is Andrew. Um, just curious, is it standard to look at uh, loss of B-cell aplasia? as a sign of relapse, or do you have to confirm actual relapse of abnormal B cells with some sort of molecular testing? Yeah, so, you know, we can't really say a patient has relapsed unless we have evidence of um, overt leukemia uh, or, or MRD. Um, B cell, loss of B cell aplasia, um, you know, clearly is a, uh, you know, is a risk factor for relapse. Um, early on within the first six months, um, you know, after, as you get further out, so beyond a year, um, you know, loss of B-cell plasia is not um, as predictive for relapse. Um, but, you know, oftentimes when we see patients lose B-cell plasia within the first six months, um, typically they'll either, you know, already have an uh, MRD recurrence at that time um, or you know, will develop MRD recurrence in the, you know, coming weeks to months following their uh, loss of B-cell aplasia. Gotcha, thanks. Um, if no one else has another question, I, if I can ask one more. Um, I'm curious, uh, with the ability of uh, all these leukemias to lose antigens, even if you have uh, like a bisistronic or what have you, like targeting multiple antigens, it's possible that you're just going to select for clones that have low expression of both of those. Um, I don't know if there's any movement in the field towards non-antigen specific uh, targeting in cell therapies um, or some way to circumvent loss of, of antigen expression. Um, that's a really speculative question, but I'm just curious if you are aware of any sort of... Uh, research and in, in focusing on that problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of any research uh, on sort of antigen agnostic immunotherapy. That's a pretty interesting idea. Um, you know, I think the idea with, um, you know, targeting multiple antigens um, is that you're, um, you know, you're reducing by the more antigens you target, um, you know, potentially the lower risk of 
um, of, of any one particular uh, uh, antigen escaping and, and leading to relapse. So um, if the if you know if the leukemia you know if you target a leukemia with um, a dual CD nineteen twenty two uh, targeted car um, and they just lose the CD nineteen, well then there should you know still be um, anti leukemic effect from the from the CD twenty two you know moiety. Um, but you know I did definitely think there is still you know potential for um, sort of dual antigen escape you know leading to leading to relapse. Yeah, I guess the way I conceptualize it is sort of like with our HIV therapies, for instance, you just block as many escape routes uh, for clonal evolution as possible. And the chance that you are able to develop such a clone gets really, really small. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess con conversely, you target an antigen that... Um, is essential for survival of the cell. So if it loses that antigen expression, it dies. And if it still has the expression, then it's killed by the CAR T cell. So there's like no escape. Um, yeah, we'll see where the field goes, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a cool idea. I wonder if there is a certain antigen that you can target and, um, you know, leads to just immediate, um, immediate death of the leukemia, that'd be make things easy easier yeah. wouldn't that be nice um, yeah <laughs> um yeah so matt um asks uh for case two and case three uh did the manufacturing of car t show any significant differences that may explain uh differences in reinfusion success um that's a good question um you know we don't uh, usually have uh, a lot of insight into uh, manufacturing of 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 the cars um, uh, when you know when this is uh, when we're, we're using commercial cars, um, which you know we that that's what we have available in in, in ALL and that's what these two patients receive. So um, I yeah I don't uh, I don't really have insight into you know any differences in the in the manufacturing there. Thank you, Mark, so much. That was really uh, enlightening. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending. See you guys next time.